I grew up with some really strange stories. Any of you remember Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories? Oh, I need a big show of hands on this one. Meet me afterward in the fellowship hall for a support group. <laughs> if you go online, you can read, uh, it's very interesting. Most of the stuff online is about people who found themselves traumatized in life by Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. <laughs> As I think about it, uh, we certainly don't tell stories the same way. One of the adapted stories was of a young girl who found herself embarrassed by her mother's hands. Later to discover that as a baby there had been a house fire and her mother had dashed past the fireman and the policeman and run into the burning house to rescue her and pull her from the flames and bring her baby out of the house that was on fire. And in the process, she had severely burned her hands. And they were burnt, scarred, red. Depending on one's aesthetic viewpoint, one might say ugly. And the girl was deeply uh, ashamed of her mother's appear hand's appearance, but once she heard the story, she could say to her mother, Mother, those are the most beautiful hands. You must have loved me very much. There were other stories that make me wonder sometimes about the psychology of the era or uh, of Seventh-day Adventists in the era or Christians in the era. I remember one story of a woman who took the punishment for her daughter, and that was by pushing a hat pin through her own hand. Any of you remember that one? Kind of bizarre. Another story along these lines that's told in evangelical circles is of a man who had uh, scarred hands. He had gone to a fire, multi-story building, and a child was trapped on top. And in this case, the parents couldn't get to him, but he climbed the drain pipe. This was back in the old days when things weren't made of PVC. This was back in the old days when things were made of wrought iron and were or actually uh, cast iron and were attached to buildings in very significant ways so that they could hold human weight quite easily. And he scaled the building on this cast iron pipe, which had heated up in the fire and it was frying his hands got into the building, rescued the child, and carried the child back down around his neck, down the, the, the pipe of the burning building. Well, the story goes that his parents were killed in this fire. He lost his family somehow in this fire. Now, I, again, I don't think this is the kind of story we would tell to children today. I, 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 just, uh, I don't hear us using these same kinds of stories, but... The town met to decide the fate of this child. Would he go to foster care? Who would adopt him? And different people wanted to adopt him, um, some promising very comfortable environments, some promising excellent education, some promising all sorts of things. But the story goes that this man at the back of the room listening to this hearing about this boy's future finally stood up and said, I can't give him a great education, and I'm not a wealthy person. But at that point, he pulled out his hands, and everybody saw his burnt hands, and they knew. And the boy came running to him and hugged him, and that became the man that got to adopt this child. Because this man had loved him enough to risk his own life to climb this building to save him, you see. These are, depending on your perspective, I think, uh, very beautiful stories. And they're, uh, in some cases, we they would strike us as odd. I think you've heard me comment on the story of Abraham and God's test of him. It seems in our cultural setting, in our day and age, a very odd thing that God would ask somebody to kill their child. And that a parent would not say to God, you've got to be kidding, this can't be you, you don't work this way. But instead would take his son on a three-day journey up a mountain, tie him, bind him, and put him on wood on an altar and raise the knife above his chest. 
This strikes us in today's world, in today's culture, as a very odd thing. And yet what comes to us in Scripture, what comes to us in Scripture so clearly, undeniably, is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed again in him might not perish but have life. What we understand in our faith is that sacrifice was ultimately the reality and sacrifice had been required. And so when we look in sacri at sacrifice in the Old Testament, what we see actually is a constant connection of that word to the rams, bulls, doves, sheep, and other things that were offered as sacrifices in the temple or upon altars. The guilt of one or the thanksgiving of one or whatever the occasion called for was transferred to the animal who was sacrificed. This supported the priestly system, of course, and on occasions like Passover provided food for a family. But it was more than that. It had deep, rich, symbolic meanings. Sacrifice could, could mean that one was really bringing a tithe, an offering to God out of thankfulness, if you will. Or one might be bringing a sacrifice because one had sinned in a particular way and needed atonement for that sin, needed a sacrifice for that sin. So somewhere along human history and religious uh, history, we have this this reality, this understanding that God and humans came to an interaction that sacrifice was, was necessary. Along the way in the Old Testament, we hear correctives to this. God says, I'm not so much thrilled with the smoke of your incense or the burnt offerings. I'm not happy with the gifts of lambs and bulls and sheep and doves. And what I really want from you is for you to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. What I really want from you is for you to take care of those in your midst, the widows and the orphans, the disadvantaged. What I really want from you is righteousness. I want you to do right. I want you not to bring me offerings of saying, I'm sorry, I want you to go the path that I've given you to go. And in the end, Jesus becomes the sacrifice once for all that takes away the sin of the world. We no longer have to bring an animal. We no longer have to bring a sacrifice. But since the crucifixion of Christ, tens of thousands of Christians have laid down their lives for the cause of God. Tens of thousands have been martyred in one way or another for their faith. It's a story we don't feel comfortable sharing or talking about anymore. It's a reality that we're, we're not, it seems so foreign to us. What on earth could possibly be worth laying your life down for? Well, maybe your child, possibly your spouse, perhaps a parent. It's just a foreign idea. Even if we think about uh, things like military service or police or fire service. We have our heroes as a culture. We're so profoundly grateful, or we feel we ought to be anyway, and, and should be, grateful for those who have given their lives in the service of a community or the service of law or the service of a country. And even that sentiment is... Uh, tainted by politics. Even that understanding is shaped, interestingly, by the world in which we live, in which so many people now join voluntarily. What does that mean in terms of sacrifice? We just have lots of things that <coughs> occupy our minds when we think about the concept, and it frankly is not a concept that comes to mind very often. And yet my thesis this morning is this, very simply. We cannot live a Christian life apart from the idea of sacrifice. 
somewhere we've got to get that notion or that understanding back into our vocabularies. Now, I'm not talking about bizarre acts of sacrifice. I'm not talking about the sacrificial cult of Judaism. I'm talking about what does it mean to lay down one's life for one's friend? What does it mean to live sacrificially? And if need be, what does it look like to die sacrificially? You see, I want to be clear about one thing. Jesus Christ came, lived, and died to take away the sin of the world. You can do no more along those lines. Your call is to live for Christ, not to die for Christ. Does that make sense to anybody here? He died so that you could live. So what is your call? To live. To live for Jesus, that's your call. So when we talk about sacrifice, we're not talking about a headlong rush into the grinder here. We're talking about living in such a way that is sacrificial for the sake of the kingdom of God. That shapes our thinking, doesn't it? We may be called upon and given the very challenging spiritual gift of martyrdom, but very few are called to that and only so that the kingdom of God can grow and expand. Because when we study history, what do we know happens when people are being martyred for the faith? What happens in those ages? More come in. What happens? The church grows prolifically in those circumstances. Underground, usually. Just think about China right now. China is a place where people are occasionally killed for political purposes. China is a place where people are definitely imprisoned for political purposes. And China is a place where Christianity, up until the Three Self Church was acknowledged by the Communist Party, could not legally exist. And yet, since communism found its footing there, the underground church has been alive. And in China, the Christianity is growing as fast or faster than in any other part of the world. China, where things are suppressed and oppressed, where everything is controlled, is a place where the gospel is taking off like crazy, including within organizations that we would more or less say are Adventists. They can't be explicitly Adventists. That is to say, we're not yet to the point where we have an organized work in such a way that they're feeding tithe to the General Conference in the same way North America is. It's not a structure that's explicit in the same way our structure is. But there are Sabbatarian three self churches that identify with our message because they've been trained by pastors who have the Seventh-day Adventist message. They are, in essence, Seventh-day Adventist churches. What are the implications? In environments of stress and oppression and political resistance, in environments in where there's risk to one's person and one's freedom, very often in those environments, the gospel spreads more rapidly and in ways that we can't quite understand. If you think about it, this makes sense, doesn't it? Because when the environment is like that, you have to make a choice. Are you going to enter that kind of risk? Are you going, do you believe enough to risk your freedom? Do you believe enough to risk your life? That's the question you're asking. And if you believe enough to risk your freedom, and if you believe enough to risk your life, then you certainly believe enough to share that belief or faith with another. And you stand as an example of somebody who believes. Now, these are hard teachings, aren't they? Because we have to confront ourselves. We have to say, do I believe enough? I'm going to suggest to you that you probably won't know until the day of testing comes. But one of the ways that you can be stretching yourself in the meantime is sharing your faith. It's a form of sacrificial living. I want to look at our text just really briefly to come back and, and just try to deal with those in a couple of ways, and then I want to come back to my story that I started with at the beginning and see if we can tie this all together. 
In the Psalm 112, I wanted, or 111, I wanted to read the whole thing because it's a beautiful psalm. But I wanted to focus on just a couple of verses. Verse 2, for example, Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. So embedded in this song, embedded in this poem, these great words are several acknowledgments. The works of the Lord are great. Creation, sustentation, deliverance. Those who love the Lord remember these deeds and ponder them because they speak of him. God's righteousness is not fleeting, but forever, as are his statutes, as are his covenants. He is gracious and compassionate, providing manna in the deserts of our lives for those who fear him. This is the God that's being praised. His precepts are trustworthy and established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. Verse 9, he provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. This, he provided redemption for his people is a powerful phrase. This is Psalms written well before Jesus comes. But there's understanding there on multiple levels. In this hymn, we find redemption, that is to say the redemption that has come, the deliverance that has come from slavery in Egypt. In this redemption, we find the Redeemer phrase, echoed in stories like Ruth and Boaz, where God has redeemed his people, he's paid the ransom price. This notion is implicit already in the Old Testament. And we find the sacrificial system referenced there too. God has provided a way, a redemption for his people, even in the context of the Psalms. When we go to Romans, this incredible tome on righteousness by faith. We come to something else that's worthwhile and very interesting, 21 to 26. The question is, what happens to the law in relationship to faith? The question is, what is it that God is up to and in this incredible bit of theology, Paul says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. This is the righteousness of God which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to everyone who believes. Righteousness. There's no difference here between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption, there's that word again, the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. There's that word sacrifice again. He was given through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he'd left the sins committed beforehand unpunished, and he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just to the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Well, that's pretty thick, isn't it? So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So he's dealing with, in this section, those sins committed past 
the forgiveness of which was postponed as they were laid upon the animals sacrificed in anticipation of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he does it in the present time because this is the basis of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, that the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world, that he was sacrificed, given for our life. We've lost this notion, and I don't know that that's, uh, I know spiritually that's a rough thing. I, I don't know culturally what that looks like. But the idea of substitutionary punishment is no longer one we can relate to. If you steal a car, it makes no sense in the world that I should go to prison for you stealing the car. That's just not how our culture works. It's not how we operate. If you commit a heinous crime, that's on you. You bear the punishment. You should bear the responsibility. You do the crime, you do the... Right. Isn't that our, our way of thinking? And yet when it comes to our faith, we've got something very different. We do the crime. He did the time. We do the crime... He paid the price. We did the crime. He laid down his life. That's a, a growing disconnect in our culture. This is the why I've titled my sermon as I have today. It's a weird title, I'll grant you. If I were looking at this online, I would think, hmm, I wonder what that guy is thinking. The odd and evolving notion of sacrifice. What does it mean to us today? What does sacrifice look like for us today? So let's go to the story in the Gospels that we read in Mark. There's a lot happening here. Jesus has been uh, in dialogue with the Pharisees and Sadducees, they've made multiple attempts to trap, trap him in this particular chapter in Mark. And now one of the teachers of the law comes to him, having heard them all debating, and throws his hat in the ring. And he decides to ask Jesus which of the commandments is the most important. And Jesus gives a brilliant answer. He quotes the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love God with all your heart with all your soul and all your mind and strength. The second is this love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments and all the law and prophets in this. And the man knows the answer is a good one. He's not a fool. And he expands even further upon Jesus' answer. This is the only place in Scripture where I know that this happens. The only place. This anonymous Pharisee or Sadducee who comes forward actually expands on the answer that Jesus gives. It's an incredible moment in Scripture. He quotes back to Jesus what he said, you're right in saying these things. It's more important than what? All burnt offerings and sacrifices. Wow. Loving God supremely and your neighbor is yourself is more important than any sacrifice you can bring to the altar. That's what the Pharisee and the Sadducee says. This expansion of Jesus' answer. Jesus didn't say that. The Pharisee or the Sadducee did. It's an incredible moment in Scripture. Just revel in it with me for a moment. Are you there? Can, how can I bring you in? I, you gotta, you got to hear this like you've never heard this. I, you know, it's there. Jesus says something absolutely remarkable to this guy. And interestingly enough, it serves just as everything else he says. It shuts him up. Jesus saw that he had answered wisely. He said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And then no one asked him anything. Do you know why? Because if you're trying to get somebody, you don't want to be identified with the one you're getting. Or they'll be getting you too. If you're trying to trap somebody, you don't want to get caught up in the trap that you've just laid. And when this man answers and Jesus responds, you're close to my position, 
You're close to where I am. You're close to the kingdom of God. That's it. Nobody wants to mess with them anymore. They have just gotten too close to the right answer and to the source of life. They've just gotten too close to the meaning that Jesus has for them in all of this. So let me ask you this. If I'm right, if sacrifice is at the very core of Christian conviction, if sacrifice is absolutely essential to the idea of Christian belief and practice, what does sacrifice look like in our context? The hint that we have here is it looks like this. You love God supremely. And Jesus said it this way, if you love, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Paul argues, as he will in Romans 3, Romans 5, Romans 8, he'll, he'll argue that the law brings condemnation and death, but in no way is it to be done away with. Interesting, huh? Because what Paul understands is that while Abraham, by faith, acted, and it was that faith that was credited to him as righteousness, Abraham also kept covenant. He obeyed the precepts of covenant that God gave him. While it was his faith that saved him and not circumcision, he went through with circumcision because that was a sign of his covenant with God. Jesus says, look, faith in me is all you need. Believe and you will be saved. But what does belief look like once we get past that statement? He says, if you love me, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be one of mine, you're going to love God supremely and you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. And that means that you're not murdering him. That means you're not stealing from him. You're not sleeping with his wife. You're not envying him. You're not hating him. It means that you're honoring God above all. You're not trying to reduce God to something material. You're not claiming to be something you aren't. You're living in accordance with the relationship and the covenant that God has established and the Sabbath has become a moment in time, a gift. These are what it means. You're going to be in relationship, love and service. That's sacrifice today. That's one clue. One very important clue. So coming back to my earlier story, we're still touched, I think, when people give of themselves for another. And I think it would be wonderful if we could take just a couple of minutes and ask you, any of you, if you might have a story you can tell in a minute or two of a sacrifice that you know of that was made on your behalf. Was there someone who did something for you? Maybe it was dramatic and it saved your life. Maybe you are a donor transplant recipient. I mean, a organ transplant recipient. Maybe you are aware of somebody's sacrificial giving that put you through Christian school or had a circumstance where a parent acted heroically to their own detriment or an adult acted heroically to their own detriment for you as a child that spared your life. Maybe it's an act of sacrifice that you've made. Maybe you've given up something. And in this Lenten season, what an appropriate thought to, to share. Anybody have a story of sacrifice? I'm going to do the walk. Oh, I see a story. Abigail has a story, and I'm looking for other hands as I walk. Okay, hon. One or two minutes. You got the mic. Um, my mom took two jobs for me to go to Weimar. 
Your mother took two jobs so that you could, was, it, was that high school or college? Weimar, it was, it's for my uh, health. So you went to Weimar for your health and your mother took on an extra job on top of the job she was doing already to pay for that. Yeah. That's sacrifice, isn't it? Did you get, did you get healthier? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it worked. Your mother's love helped make you whole in that story. That's wonderful. Any other stories of sacrifice? Okay, I'm not exiting the building. I'm going to make one more pass here. Love to hear another story of sacrifice. Well, we'll let you think about this. I know that some of you will email me or call me this week. Maybe you'll want to tell your story next week. I have a microphone. It's going, 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 going. I see one more. Inga has a story. My um, great aunt moved in with us when she was about 76 years old and took on a feisty three-year-old and an angry 10-year-old and was our mom for the next few years. That was awesome. That is awesome. How did that come to be? My mom passed, and so my dad was left alone with two kids and uh, obviously working full-time and needed help. And she was how old? 76. How many of you at 76 want to take on a three-year-old and an angry 10-year-old? Feisty three-year-old. I was feisty. <laughs> you were feisty? I can't imagine that, Inga. I can't imagine that you were feisty. It's a beautiful story. Here's a woman who should be enjoying her retirement, quieting down her days. You know, energy is a little lower usually in our 70s than 60s and 50s and 40s and 30s and so on. It's the way life works. God made us to have young children in our 20s, maybe 30s, so that we would have the energy to keep up with them. We all know parents in their 40s, right? And, we, and if you're one of them, God bless you. How can we help you? And if you're not one of them, uh, we, we all have smiled and noted just how much energy it takes to raise a small child and how tough that is to do as we get older. And a woman 76 took on a 3-year-old and a 10-year-old because... There was a loss, and she could fill the gap. She sacrificed her time and energy and gave of her love. Anybody else? These are wonderful stories. Richard, good. Are you having fun? This is a story of when I was not a real Christian, but there was a sacrifice that was made for me. I was going to a job interview in Houston, and uh, I was called last minute to get on a plane, go to Hobby Airport, and then get down to a hotel room to be at an interview at 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, I arrived at the airport at 11 o'clock at night. No taxi cab service, no way to get to my hotel. And a stranger came to me, and uh, he offered me a ride. He went 80 miles out of his way from his home to take me to Houston and get me into my hotel room at 2 o'clock in the morning. That stayed with me most of my life now, that when I can give, I give. Amen. Isn't that powerful? Here's a person, a complete stranger, could have been an angel, complete stranger who went way out of his way to give of something to a, somebody he didn't know. I want to be in bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. Anybody else? Some of you are night owls, but I want to be fast asleep at 2 a.m., not driving to Houston. Anna. One more here. Hi. Uh, some of you know me. My name is Anna Camarina. Um, I, um, my story is a little bit multi-generational. I'll make it really short. Uh, when I was born, I was two, a two-month, I mean a two-pound premature baby. And um, 52 years ago, that it was kind of a miracle for me to uh, make it through. Um, my parents were told that they had to pay cash for my care at Glendale Adventist because 
um, something to do with the insurance, um, or else they could take me out of the hospital and put me back in uh, and readmit me as a sick baby. So my dad had to take on two jobs back then, and um, it kept me alive. And um, after that, uh, I tried to have a normal childhood and adulthood. I married uh, young. I had two sons, and um, premature babies tend to have premature babies. So one of my sons was born uh, well, was trying to be born premature, and uh, so I was given a concentrated shot of hormones that, to this day, 27 years later, has me with hormonal imbalances. And um, through the years, I've seen my husband work two jobs for 20 years plus, and um, we were able to keep our boys in Christian school, and we are so thankful. There were years I worked part-time and sick, very sick. Uh, I have hormonal seizures um, caused by hormonal charges in my body. And um, so I worked very sick, but continued to work to keep our kids in our Christian schools. And um, this is one of my sons, David. Yeah. I'm so proud of my boys. <laughs> um, he is a psychologist, works with kids of all mental incapacities. And um, our other son is a doctor doing a VA. Uh, he's at the VA hospital in Loma Linda. He's a podiatrist. And I get very emotional because I see how the Lord always puts people our way to help us continue to serve others. Um, so that's my story. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Anna. These are stories, your stories, and I know there are many more, those of you who haven't said a word, those of you who had parents who did something extraordinary, grandparents, an aunt and uncle, a stranger. Stories of sacrifice. A couple weeks ago I said, I quoted uh, Smuts Van Royen who said, when God's story becomes our story, the future of the Adventist church will be profoundly affected. I don't remember the exact word he said, but secure, it will be uh, understood, it will be made manifest. The story of God is the story of sacrifice. That's the story of God. And when we're ready to embrace that story and love God supremely, and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. No one will be able to stop this community. Nobody will be able to stop this church. Powers of hell itself cannot prevail against it. When you step up in faith, to be the church, when you're ready to love sacrificially, when you're ready to give sacrificially, when you're able to embrace another that you may not have a lot in common with, the church will not be stopped. I praise God for sacrifice.